Hello and welcome to another brand new episode of What the Fintech, the podcast from the team behind Fintech Futures and the Banking Technology Magazine. My name is Paul Hindle, editor of Fintech Futures, and for this episode we're joined by Sarah Hinkfuss, partner at Bain Capital Ventures. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you again. Excellent. Yeah, it's great to see you again as well. I mean, just to get started, would you like to quickly give us an introduction to yourself and then a bit more about your role at Bain? Yes, happy to. So I'm a partner, as you said, at Bain Capital Ventures. That's the venture capital arm of Bain Capital, the global investment management firm. So we've been around for 20 years as a separate fund within the Bain Capital umbrella. We're investing out of our most recent fund, which is a $1.9 billion vehicle that scans everywhere from pre-seed all the way through pre-IPO. I sit on the growth team, and that focuses on Series B plus opportunities. And we invest across fintech, of course, commerce tech, application software, and infrastructure and security. And then just in terms of quick background on myself, so I actually started my career in enterprise software. So working at a venture-backed company that sold into large consumer-facing firms, um, all big data and predictive analytics software. And so I was there for six years helping scale and build the company before we were acquired by MasterCard in 2015. And then I came up to California, went to business school at Stanford and transitioned into investing, um, spending my first bit of time at Cowboy Ventures, an early stage firm in Silicon Valley founded by Alien Lee. And then was able to spend three years at KKR, really learning how to be a growth investor before coming over to Bain Capital three years ago. Excellent. Yeah, well, again, it's great to have you on the show this week, Sarah. We'll be taking a look at the current state of play in the venture capital space amid what has been an eventful start to 2023 in the banking sector and a wider slowdown in investments and funding for fintechs as a result of the challenging macroeconomic conditions that have gripped the global economy over the last few years. We'll be diving into this topic over the course of the show, covering what the BC outlook for fintech in 2023 looks like at the moment how Bain has looked to navigate the current climate and its strategy moving forward, as well as the current investment trends and areas to keep an eye on. All that's to come a bit later in the show, but as always, to get us started is our news and numbers segment. This is where our guest has gone out and found a news story featuring an interesting number to discuss. So, Sarah, what have you brought along for us today? Yes, I love this, and I'm thrilled we're starting here. So the number that I wanted to bring from the news from the past week or so is 6 to 18. And that is in specific, and that was part of the news itself, but what that describes is the age group that GoHenry, the investing product, focuses on among the entire population. And as your listeners will know, Acorns acquired GoHenry this past week. And what was not in the news was the actual valuation or the size or anything like that. And I also should share, I don't have confidential information around this as well, but I think it's really interesting because it talks about the funding environment that I know we're going to be getting into, but I think we're going to see this as one example of many more examples of acquisitions that are happening in this market. And so just thinking about what it means. So for Acorns, it's an opportunity to expand their market geographically. So obviously it's a U.S. domiciled company. And they have looked to expand geographically and Go Henry being located in the UK is a way to actually have a location already there with a brand that's recognized as well. And second of all, it helps them capture an earlier market. And so Acorns had experimented with products that would appeal to younger age groups as a way to really create the on-ramp to their investing. But Go Henry has an established customer base there and has a lot of educational products that they've created around this age group. And so it's really a perfect on-ramp and complement to the Go, to the Acorns product. And then for Go Henry, they get a larger platform in an area where scale really matters for economics. And so in wealth management, of course, there are a lot of elements of that business model where the larger you are or the larger your assets are AUM, the better pricing that you have. And so immediately overnight by combining the two entities, the overall economics actually improve for both of them, especially for Go Henry. And then second of all, it helps them address the graduation risk. And so with 6 to 18, of course, does not mean 6 to 19 or, or 6 to 20. And so as folks are graduating out of Go Henry, now they have a platform in Acorns that they can be a part of. And so I think this is really interesting, as I said, because I think we're going to see a lot more M&A in this market. And the two reasons for that, one is the funding environment has changed, as you talked about in the introduction as well. And so folks really have the decision between grow 
So raise capital on your own or be able to grow by preserving capital and getting to profitability or to be acquired is another path to exit or to go under, right? Like those are kind of your options. And I think in the low cost of capital environment, when there was a ton of funding, this be acquired option was not considered as much, like it was less attractive or less sexy. And so I do think this is one of the many deals, again, that is bringing this back into the forefront as being a really attractive option because it makes strategic sense for both sides. And then the second reason I would say is because for the larger entities, so Acorns in this case, there is always a buy versus build decision that's happening inside of companies. And again, in this funding environment where it is harder to get that incremental equity dollar or it's more expensive to get it, I should say, the conversation has shifted within companies that perhaps it's better to buy or to partner than it is to build internally because it requires so many internal resources and also it fractures the focus of the company. And so I think we're going to see an increasing number of companies who are looking externally to smaller partners, maybe that they've worked with over many years, as a way to actually bring them in-house and have those teams become a part of their product. And so I'm excited to see what I think will be a lot more of this coming in the environment. Yeah, no, definitely. It's quite interesting what you're saying there as well with them having essentially the whole age range now, right? So you've got as you mentioned, Go Henry covering the six to eighteen range, but when you graduate from that into the Acorns full platform, I guess after that you've basically got a full offering that covers the entire age range there. So that's a yeah, really interesting move. I guess, you know, as you've mentioned there, M and A now becoming an alternative maybe for some companies as opposed to the funding. Would you say now that there are fintechs out there trying to court the attention of the bigger players in the space to to initiate the sale given the reduction in funding options? Yeah, I think it's always a delicate dance that has to be done (laughs) in the market. And so the easiest way to do it is getting to know partners over time. And so having an authentic relationship where you've built trust and the product synergy and the team synergy is clear because I think it's it can be really scary for founders just talking to friends and folks that I work with. It can be scary to imagine putting yourself up for sale, so to speak, because it is not a powerful position in the market. And so I think people are afraid of doing that because it could weaken their hand in any negotiation. And so I think rather the path that we're seeing where these opportunities are catalyzed is that there is a standing relationship. There's the interest in becoming deeper in the integration. And so maybe that is sharing proprietary data, for example, or having that, having a more direct integration that is only with one partner and exclusive to not allow other partners to do it. And that that product conversation becomes a catalyst to say, hey, actually, is there something more that we could do to actually bring ourselves together? And so I think that's become in more cases than not, the way that this authentically happens. The alternative, of course, is when it is more of a fire sale, right? So someone has to actually find an owner. And in the news, right, like we've seen examples of that come up as well. So like Railsers is is one that has come up in the news recently in the UK, for example. And I think that was an opportunity rather where they had walked, they had worked through a process. And again, I don't have confidential information, but I could imagine they've worked through a process. And then at the end of it, they had to figure out how the pieces could belong in different companies. And so that's what happens if you're not able to find it earlier on. I'm going to move us into the kind of investment side of things now then. I'm going to start off with a few stats. So global fintech investment fell in 2022 to 164.1 billion from a record high of 238.9 billion in 2021. So that accounts for a drop of 31%. Putting that into context, that's still the third best year when it comes to fintech investment, but it's still quite a noticeable drop off from the year previous, especially when you consider there was a fall of more than 50% in H2 2022 compared to H1 2022 as well. So I guess to start off then, as we move into 2023 now, What's the feeling in the VC kind of investment space right now? I mean, given the shape of the economy and the recent turmoil that we've had in the kind of banking sector, is sentiment still quite low or is there some positivity at the moment? Yeah, great question. And when you were talking through the different numbers too over time, it I think it's 
it represents how much the perspective, so on, on which years you look at or which months you look at, how much that perspective anchors how you feel. <laughs> um, and so exactly to your point, if you look at just the last two years or the last three years, it looks like a momentous drop. But if you actually scan out and look over a longer period of history, then you can see that things were relatively constant but growing. There was a huge surge and now things have come back. But even in this coming back, they're still above where they were historically. So I really just love the way that you set that up. So to answer your question, we are seeing things heating up. I think 2022 was this period of reflection and really coming to terms with the world as being different than it was in 21. And so it was very tumultuous and very emotional. And coming into 23, we had more of that <laughs> with the SVB crisis and, and Credit Suisse. And, and so it hasn't ended. But what I think it's laid bare is that people now realize or are coming to terms that this reality that we're in is the reality that we all need to be building businesses in. And so there's a recognition that the work still has to be done if the best thing to do for a company is to raise capital and the trade-off is growing more slowly or not building that new product or not hiring those engineers or whatever and raising the round that it's better to actually get out and have the conversations with trusted partners and test the market, so to speak, than it is to just stay hunkered down. And so we're definitely seeing many more raises that are actually coming out. And we're seeing people who are open to having a more diverse conversation around what valuation may be as well. I think it's also showing how complex the world is. And it was a simple world before if everyone should raise because there was so much capital out there and the cost of capital is really low. Like it's really relatively simple. And the complexity of the world now that we're returning to is exactly what it was before. And so this question of how much runway do I have? Am I pre or post product market fit? What growth do I need to hit to get to my next valuation? Like all of those questions, they're highly specific to every company. And so it's a really important conversation to have with your board or with your set of advisors. And there is no one size fits all. But overall, we're seeing people starting to come out and things really heating up. Yeah, you mentioned, obviously, briefly the upheaval that we've had on the banking side of things with SVB and Credit Suisse. How has that impacted Bain and your strategy at all? And if so, how have you looked to, to navigate that? Yeah, totally. So most immediately, of course, the question for SVB was on access to capital. And so we, along with many other venture firms, were in a position where we were able to, over the course of that weekend, put together packages for our companies who needed access to capital. And so obviously things resolved themselves and none of that ended up having to go through. But I think our ability to act quickly and show that we were partners that our companies could rely on really matters. And so it was a really scary time, a time that no one wanted, but also a time to build trust. And I think sometimes those two things come hand in hand, that when there is uncertainty around you, the people that you can rely on really matter. And so just as like a, a an emotional moment, I think it's one that we're not going to forget for a long time. In terms of how we build from here, so one very practical implication was thinking through treasury management. And so as it had been because of the rising interest rate environment, we were working with our portfolio companies on yield management. And so for the extra cash that you have available, where are you investing that cash in order to make sure you're maximizing your yield? And so I think already this conversation had come up for many companies, but the treasury management side of it is, of course, in what accounts are you holding that? And what are what's, what is the security of those funds across those different accounts? And so the complexity of that additional piece I think is something that especially a lot of early stage companies weren't thinking through before this because, I mean, they're, they're trying to find product market fit. They're hiring a bunch of people. There's like so much happening. And so it just wasn't on the top of the list. But what I think this did is really push it to the top of the list. And so it's a space that we're just making it really easy for our portfolio companies by putting together, you know, a checklist of best practices around what we recommend and helping people open those accounts when appropriate, et cetera. I think the other thing that it's interesting, and we're still seeing this play out in the market, is the debt side of things. And so Silicon Valley Bank had many different ways that they supported the ecosystem. One of them, obviously, is being, as we were talking about, a place where deposit accounts were held. And so that's why there was such an impact, obviously, when folks didn't have access to their funds. 
But the other side was actually on the debt. And so debt comes in a few different forms. It could be lines of credit that lending companies are like have available in order to enable their entire business model to run. And Silicon Valley Bank was known for being more flexible on those terms, especially for startups who were just getting started, but maybe that CEO had a long-term relationship with SVB. So they so SVB could underwrite that company in a way that they a lot of other banks weren't able to. And so that enabled these companies to get started in the market. And now there's the question of, especially for these smaller lines of credit, who's going to step into those opportunities. And then on the venture debt side, there was a lot more openness by SVB to underwriting earlier stage companies or companies that were further from revenue or had less clarity around revenue. And that source of capital was a catalyst in the market to complement the equity capital. And so just speaking to friends who are at larger credit organizations, a lot of these funds have minimum check sizes that they just can't invest 15, like a $10 million venture debt or $15 million venture debt. Like that size or scale doesn't make sense because of the way that their funds are constructed. And so in a gap, which is what SEB has created, of course, we're going to see new players come in, but I think it's still very much an open question as to how the new players interact with startups and to what extent venture debt in this new market plays the role that it did in the old market, or if companies will need to piece together instead equity within the venture space or other forms of structured credit. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting time, I think, at the moment, um, given the, given the fallout. We've seen a few down rounds as well recently, right? Some huge company valuations that we were seeing in these early days of 2021 being cut significantly in some cases. Do you think that this valuation consolidation was needed in the space and has it hit a fair level now do you think and again how have these falling valuations maybe impacted the pain at all yeah sure so i previewed this a little bit when we were talking in the beginning about the amount of capital that's been put into fintech over time but generally speaking we're still coming back to historical averages so just at the highest level valuations have come down but it coming down is just a function of looking at from 21. But if you look at it from 2019 and 2020, valuations are still up. And I do think gravity is a powerful force. (laughs) And so I think you're going to have valuations that return to historical averages with the continued upward trend that we've just seen in, in history. And so I do think there's an element of this, which is just the way that it is going to be going forward. The other interesting piece of it is to think about what a valuation is. So As a growth investor, I take more of a quantitative approach to thinking through valuations than early stage investors might, where there's just less metrics or less data available in a company. And so we think about valuations as what is the size of a company? So how quickly can a company grow over time? And at the time that they exit, how much TAM is available to that company? And so what is the total terminal value of what a company could be, and then basically mapping that back in terms of what the valuation today, therefore, is implied by that exercise. And so the reason why I think we've seen a lot of the big company or big headline valuations come down is because the rate of growth has slowed because fintech is really just a correlate of the economy. And so as the economy has come down, the amount of payments going through the economy has come down, the amount of e-com has come down, right? Like all of these things just come down as the economy in general has slowed. And so the pace of growth has slowed, but also what it's put into question is how big can things get ultimately? And so the idea that every company should have, or every wallet should have like investment management, for example, just to like pick on one space, like maybe that's actually not true. (laughs) Like maybe we don't need six different like investment portfolio apps in every single one of our wallets, for example. And so I think we have started in this market now as well to question like what the total size of the prize or the total size of opportunities is. And so those two twin effects, the growth rate, as well as the total market that's addressable at the terminal space, I think those two things have both brought valuations back down to earth. That all being said, fintech is a massive market. (laughs) And also we have the benefit in this space of investing against generational tailwinds. And so The digital payments, for example, is something that we're going to just see continue to march across history. 
or the opportunity for real-time payments or the opportunity for lending to be embedded within the experiences or other platforms that we're using. Like all of these elements, I think, are history in the making, but just the pace of change has slowed down versus what it was in 21. Excellent, excellent. Looking at data as well from KPMG, we're still seeing a lot of deal volume in the space when it comes to seed rounds, right? So there was apparently a record amount of investments in 2022 in in, in seed rounds. Bodes well for the long-term future of the space. Are we at the point now, is this something that you've been noticing as well, where maybe these smaller seed rounds are seen as the better long-term options? Yeah, it's so interesting. And so As I said in my introduction, we at BCV have the opportunity of looking across stages. And so I love that you asked this. And so I would say the earliest stages have continued to be active persistently. And in some ways, it's been even more exciting. And the reason for that is, I think in a down market, there's a rallying cry for it's a time for builders. And when the market traded down, you had a lot of budding founders, right? So like these are le- top engineers or top product managers at large financial services or fintech companies who always had this like glimmer of a company that they wanted to build like in their eye. There was no reason for them to like jump off and take that risk. And then when the market traded down and a lot of equity or stock options like traded down, I think it made the value of being at some of these larger companies less attractive. And it really, there was this feeling in the water that the time is now to like jump off and do it. And so there were a lot of folks who left the publicly traded fintech and financial services companies, as well as those who were in some of the larger private, like pre-IPO fintech companies as well. And so we saw this incredible amount of talent actually coming into the early stage ecosystem with ideas that had been in development for a while. But this now felt like the moment where the opportunity cost was lower to actually take that jump and build. And so I do think on the earliest stages, it's been like really exciting. In addition to that, there's the acknowledgement that it is harder to raise funding today. And so as you think about the different factors that make it harder to scale and grow, one obviously is competition as well. And so the more companies there are in a space, the more the harder it is for each and every single one of them to get their message out, talk about their differentiation, like build that over time in the product. And so with it being harder to raise money, I think we are seeing less competition. And so those companies that are able to get in and scale are in a market sense, like much better positioned as well. And so all of these things are contributing to a lot of excitement on the early stage. That doesn't mean, however, that the growth, like the growth market is totally dead. I do think we saw, and the numbers show this, very little activity happening for the last year, let's say. And I think that was really a function of so many companies raised enough capital that they didn't have to come back out or There were insider bridge rounds that happened, for example. And so that was able to bring the companies a little bit further to really reorganize their internal financing or their product strategy in order to then tell the story to come back out to the market. And so we are seeing that come back out now. And I think the companies that are best positioned are those that are still in a growthful moment, like they're on the offensive, not on the defensive. And they're in particular retaining their best talent because they're building to a higher purpose or like a bigger vision of what that company can be. So, I mean, given where we are in the year right now, we're coming into the middle of April. What funding trends then are you seeing at the moment, maybe in terms of looking at fintech specifically, which areas are seeing some of the biggest levels of of interest and investment? Yeah, it's pretty disparate, I would say. And the reason for that is, In general, what we've seen in this market is that there is a return to what people know. And so this is less of a comment around BCV, although I think we fit into this, and more of just from speaking to friends who are investors across the landscape. I think teams are really, if there was a fund that had always done early stage and then had dabbled in growth, for example, people have come back for growth and focused on early stage. And then I think we've also seen that across spaces as well. And one of the critiques of what we saw happen in fintech over the last three years is that because the market was so hot, the economy was so hot, 
And as I said, fintech is a correlate of the economy. And so that meant fintech was like was growing really well. We had a lot of tourist investors, so to speak, who were not dedicated um, scholars of fintech come into fintech without truly understanding the business models and putting a lot of capital in, in companies. And so what that did is really raise valuations. But a lot of that has been laid bare because the GMV, for example, of a company or the gross revenue is not the same as the net revenue or the gross margin or the contribution profit. And so understanding how the P&L of a fintech company actually is combined and how a company actually actually makes money is really important. And so there is an opportunity now for the fintech investors, so people who are dedicated to the craft of this space and love this space and are working with the founders who are fintech experts themselves, to really look where other people aren't looking. And so one example of that is balance sheet companies. And so lending companies and insurance companies that have not just equity capital requirements, but also the balance sheet or the like the cost of capital on that side as well. So the opportunity for companies on that space that have been really squeezed by this market, there are amazing companies still created and there's far fewer people looking there. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity. And then just to name three areas where we're focused in particular, I would share the office of the CFO. So in this market, the CFO has become that much more critical sitting around the table and helping the team from a cash flow forecasting perspective, as I was talking about from yield management or the treasury management. And then also we're hearing from our companies and from talking to others in the space, just the pace of reforecasting has become significantly higher because of the needs to be really flexible and dynamic in this market. And so the CFO has really risen, so to speak, in terms of the importance of the controls that they have on the business and the way they're strategically supporting the CEO and the other members of the management team. And that's really shined a light on how insufficient a lot of the software products are that the CFO is using. So that's a space that we're spending a lot of time. A second one I'd offer is vertical SaaS as well. And so if you think about the parts of the economy that are most impacted or less impacted by what's happening on the macro, you'll see that there's a lot of it in the US, there's a lot of like Main Street America, we say, that is less impacted by what's happening. And so the companies that are serving these small businesses are often vertical SaaS platforms. And the reason why this is relevant for fintech is because they often have the opportunity to embed other forms of financial services directly within those platforms. And so we're really looking at that side of the economy as well, um, not ignoring the huge opportunity and the revolution that's happening there, even if it hasn't always been on the headlines, so to speak, of where people have been looking. And then the third place I'd offer is wealth management as well. And so similar to the CFO conversation that I had Wealth management, it when everything's going really well, you don't really care <laughs> um, what that relationship is that you have with your wealth manager or how well your stock trading app is helping you understand performance or helping you maximize tax loss harvesting, for example. But when things aren't going well, there's a lot more anxiety that you have and desire for transparency and information, and you really want a credible partner to help you navigate through it. And so we're seeing the interest that people have in getting this right increase. And so it's a huge opportunity for technology to really step into that void. And it's a space as well that has seen quite a bit of consolidation and that has revealed some infrastructure and software players as being at the right side of history on those trends. And AI and particularly generative AI has been in the headlines quite a lot recently, exploding in popularity. And I know you've recently wrote a report on this as well. So I wanted to check briefly with you how much impact do you think this technology could have on the financial services sector and how are banks and maybe other fintechs look to, to really tap into that? Yeah, I'm shocked it's 30 minutes through and <laughs> this is the first time we're talking about generative AI. No, I'm just kidding with you. So I do think Financial services is extremely well positioned to take advantage of generative AI, but I do think it is a fraught concept as well. And so that's part of what I talk about in the post that I had on the opportunity for generative AI in financial services. And just to touch on that piece of it quickly, in particular, financial services demands 100% accuracy. And that is because there are a lot of regulatory requirements 
and the relationship that we have with our financial services entities as being risk bearing entities like really requires that. And so generative AI works extremely well when you need 90% of the truth. And so obviously we've heard a lot about hallucinations and other ways that the process that is being used in the same way that humans do this as well, right? Like we're using what we understand to approximate the truth of what we think an answer to a question is. But the problem is that's often not good enough in financial services contexts. And so what I found really interesting as I wrote about this space is that there was a lot of excitement across sales and marketing, across coding, across image generation, right? Like of all these spaces had a lot of, they were really on their forefront when it came to generative AI. But I saw my financial services colleagues hanging back a little bit more. And so I do think the opportunity and the reason why I still say financial services is extremely well positioned, a a few different reasons. So number one, financial services companies, either incumbents or fintech companies, can leverage generative AI in the same way as others do across different spaces, such as for chatbots to support customers in questions that they have, such as how to open new accounts or how to change a password, or such as for marketing content creation to make it more customized to a user's experience or such as for code completion. And so Chime, for example, came out and their CTO talked about how they're using generative AI to help complete code. And so those three examples are not specific to financial services, but that is to say financial services shouldn't sit on the sidelines and not use generative AI in places that are not regulatorily fraught. But secondarily, I do think there are opportunities within the specific structures or workflows that are a part of financial services companies to leverage generative AI. And so I go through a number of examples in my article, but just to mention one, it's in the creation of memos that are a part of every loan committee. And so every mortgage process that you go through or every new loan, there is this process of coming up, of bringing together all of the information that you have about a borrower and capturing it in a memo and then presenting it to the risk committee to actually discuss that opportunity. And that is perfect for for generative AI because it is collecting all the information and then distilling it and pulling out the relevant facts. And it takes humans a while to do that, but that could be heavily impacted by generative AI. And so it's not a place where I would say generative AI should do 100% of that. Like we should flip a switch and go from humans to generative AI. But I do think generative AI could actually help us to take the first step or do 90% of the work. And then you still have that team, that broker or whoever it is who's managing that process, that the banker, who is able to correct and look through to make sure that everything's accurate and then attest to the accuracy for the loan committee. Another place that we've seen this is in expense management as well. And so a number of companies have come out and talked about in this process of actually mapping the receipts or purchase orders to actual payments, there's so much information that is available around the transactions and transaction descriptions, but that process today is heavily manual and heavily fraught. And so leveraging AI as a much better way to actually look for the patterns and be able to make recommendations around the reconciliation process that has to happen. And so there are a few companies that have come out for that. And once again, it's not to say that 100% of the time it'll be accurate, but if you can have an accuracy score or a score that helps you to recommend which of the transactions there's less confidence on, and so those have to be reviewed, and which co- which transactions there's more confidence on, and then those could be assumed to be true by the AI. Those are ways to like think about some of the requirements that financial services companies have for accuracy. And then just the final thing I would say is that it is important that tools are enterprise ready. And so on the infrastructure side, this is something we're thinking a lot about at um, Bank Capital Ventures as well. And so for that, I mean, OpenAI's ChatGPT, which obviously captured everyone's attention, that is a contributory data model. And so all the information that you're putting into ChatGPT is also being used and consumed to actually continue to train the model over time. And that's great for silly questions that people are asking around writing poetry (laughs) or, or whatever, but it's not okay for private information that is what 
most of the data is that financial services companies are using. And so there is a whole set of data tools that are being created that are specifically helping companies make generative AI enterprise ready. And the data privacy part of it is just one of like many different dimensions of that problem. And so I think there's huge opportunity to answer your question, but there are still ways that financial services companies have to think about making it applicable to their environment. Excellent. Excellent. And just to finish off then, I read earlier this year, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Bain closed two oversubscribed funds totaling $1.9 billion. What advice would you give then to companies who are looking to to get some investment from Bain? Yeah, great question. So we're thrilled to have the trust of our LPs and to have proven through our track record over time that our like our continued investments are a great place for LPs to put their funding. And that's ultimately what our job is, is to maximize the returns for them. And as we think about investing in this market, then we're not changing what we're doing in so much as we know that the market will go up and down over time, but these are long-term relationships that that we're building with companies. And so what the market looks like at the time they exit, no one knows, right? Like no one has a crystal ball to say what that is. And so we continue to focus on investing in the best founders with the most audacious visionary product ideas that are really changing the world as we know it. And so the single biggest recommendation or point of feedback that I would have is to really think about building a relationship over time. And so to not be transactional in so much as coming out when you're raising only, because that doesn't give us an opportunity to know you And nor does that give you an opportunity to get to know us. And these relationships are decades, decades in the making. And so I love the opportunity to sit down and talk about a space and share perspectives on what we've seen in the market, on what's working or what's not working, on pressure testing the theories or hypotheses that a founder has in terms of what the next stage of their product development looks like or what the next stage of their go-to-market strategy looks like. And so I would invite these conversations that perhaps seem less directed, but I think are exactly the ways that you build that trust and credibility over time. And that foundation is what enables the leap of faith, ultimately, that both sides have in a funding round. That is, they want us The founder wants us as their partner, and we want to invest in them for the next 10 years to build the vision that they have into reality. Thanks so much for all the the great insights, Sarah. To close out the podcast, we always finish with our now infamous fintech jail. So this is where we ask for an industry term, buzzword or trend that you've heard enough of and you want to cast away. Which buzzword would you like to hand a sentence to then this week? Yeah, so my buzzword for this is a little spicy. And the reason I say that is because it's a term that we are very well associated with and it's embedded finance. And so I think... As I think about fintech jail, as you said, it's a word that is overused in the industry and not always used correctly. And so I think embedded finance is abused in the way that it's used today. And so what it means, obviously, is consuming financial services through a non-financial services channel. And that could be payments or lending or insurance. But I think it's been abused, especially in the last market cycle that we saw, because everyone thought that every software company should become a financial services company, or there was that idea in the market. And that's totally wrong. (laughs) It is not the case that every company should become a fintech company. And that's that hype created a romanticization of the idea. The reality is there's a great deal of complexity and a great deal of cost that comes along with the decision to actually manufacture financial services within the context of software. And it's not appropriate for all companies. And so what I think instead that we're seeing a return to now is that there are some companies that are well positioned to do so as a way to create more value for their customers, as a way to increase the lifetime value that they receive from their customers. And so all of those are good reasons to actually embed financial services. But as I said earlier in the podcast, not every wallet should have an investing app. 
And so I think we're seeing a return to what this should be, which is not the abuse that the term has been over the past couple of years. Yeah, no, I think I'm in an agreement with you there. I mean, embedded finance was first actually put back into the jail back in season one of the podcast before later being broken out. So it's a repeat offender, this one, actually. And I think initially when it was put in, it was relatively new term. A lot of people were jumping on the bandwagon. It just started getting overused. So relatively similar kind of reasons there. Um, Usually what I say at this point is, you know, if we're going to throw this into the jail what would you like to replace it with? But I think really you're just arguing that we just need to stop overusing the term when it's not needed. Yes, exactly. I think it's recognizing it's not for every company and every financial services product is not appropriate for every situation. And so as is as is true in so much of life, the simple answer sounds really nice, but it's the devils and the details and the complexity really matters. And so we're really seeing that return to financial services. The specificity and like getting that strategy right is important. And that's true in embedded finance as well. Excellent. Sounds great. Well, in which case I am I'm more than happy to to cast it back into the jail. I think it's uh yeah, had a had a fair bit of time out, but it's clearly hasn't learned its lesson from the initial time, so we'll send it. <laughs> send it back in. Well, that's all we have time for this episode. Thanks, of course, to Sarah for joining me. As for Fintech Futures, you can find us online at www.fintechfutures.com, on Twitter at Fintech Futures, and of course on LinkedIn. If you like this podcast and our other episodes, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcasting service to get notified about future episodes. Thanks as well to Arama for editing this podcast. You can check them out at arama.tv. As always, thank you very much for your support. We'll see you soon for another episode of What the Fintech. But until then, goodbye.